all rests, it seems, on the shoulders of men who can control nothing. The voices whisper of trusting the Father. Schedules scream of doubt, and actions cry out in disbelief. The world gives itself up to incessant activity, merely because it knows nothing better. All rests, it seems, on the shoulders of men who can control nothing. Heavenly Father, today as we just take these next couple of minutes to reflect on your word, I pray, Lord, that you will fill this place with a spirit of rest. God, I'm not talking about the kind of rest that's going to make anybody start snoring. I'm talking about the kind of rest that we need to experience in our lives when we feel like the weight of the world is on our shoulders. It's all on us. And where do we go from here? How do we endure? How do we overcome? I believe there's power in the word that I'm about to share that can set captives free in this room today. And I'm asking you, God, to prepare the soil quickly because I, I don't want to waste any time. I want to jump right into this, Lord, and share what I believe you have, want for us to share. Help us find the rest that has been given by God. In Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Let us run. Remember when we talked about that a couple weeks ago? After, after, after a uh, series on prayer and talking about the things, we, the, the, the principles we need to learn as believers, we talked about the power of prayer, and then we jumped into this next one in Hebrews where it basically said, okay, now ha having done all these things, let us now run. Now let us do something with what we've learned. There comes a point where you need to stop just reading the Bible, going to church, doing the Bible studies, going through the motions, doing all the steps. There comes a time when you have to let us do, move, go forward. Let us run. And then last week we talked about let us walk. If you remember that, it was really, in essence, talking about those seasons in our lives when, <clears throat> when, it's kind of like a person who decides they're going to run. You know, I'm going to, I, I, need, I need to pick, take up running. I need to get in shape. I'm going to get outside. I'm going to, I'm going to put on my most comfortable tennis shoes, and I'm going to run from my house down to the beach. And boy, for the first half mile, you're looking good. You've got great form. Your feet are coming down nice and soft. You've got a good stride. And next half mile, spurts. And by the third half mile, you look like, you look like that little bag lady. You're just kind of shuffling your feet. Calling it running, but you're actually walk, going slower than the person walking next to you, right? Oh, well, we can run, but then eventually we've run to a point where we can't run anymore and we're, we're worn out. And, and what's left to do? You want to just stop, take a break, <clears throat> get under the shade, go in the house, go sit in the hot tub. That's what I want to do. Yeah, even if it's 100 degrees, I'm cool. Well, I'm not cool, but, but, it, but it's a good idea. <laughs> sit in that hot tub and relax. But no, you can't do that. In the journey that we're in, we need to run. And if we can't run, then let us walk it out. We've got to walk out those seasons when things are harder and more difficult. And today, I want to talk to you about the next let us. Let us rest. Let us rest. We've been in the book of Hebrews. And today, we're going to be talking in the book of Hebrews 4. But in Hebrews 3, it kind of sets the stage before we enter into 4. So I want to kind of set the stage real quick. So that four will even make more, more, more uh, impact on, on us today. In Hebrews chapter 3, the writer shares a warning from the Holy Spirit about unbelief. He recognizes that Israel saw God's power and salvation 
when they were rescued out of Egypt, that they had experienced this incredible power of God. They knew what God was capable of when he came and rescued them from Egypt. And yet, in that process of not even completely being rescued out of it, they're, st- they're in the process of being rescued. They're almost there. What happens? They begin to doubt when he can't cross over and enter into the promised land. Oh, they're excited. They've seen it, but then, but then doubt rises up even before he can finish his work. The writer goes on to say God made it clear that even in the desert experience that they now had to live out for 40 years because they didn't have faith to enter over, to cross over. The, 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 the spies went in and came back and built doubt so they didn't take hold of God's promise. So they, they went on the laps, you know. And for, as they're traveling through the desert, God made it clear that even in the desert, experience after experience, of their rebellion, he would still provide for their everyday needs. He provided sustenance every morning and every night. There was a cloud, a cloud of fire that led them at night, pillar of smoke that led them during the day. Manna would fall from the heavens. He would provide what they needed even though they were in the desert because of their lack of faith to receive what God had. Let me tell you something. That's a merciful God. How many of you, you your kids don't, are, are appreciative? You put the food in front of their face, and say, yeah, I hate that food. Then go to bed. You don't need any dinner tonight, right? That's what we want them to do. Fine, starve. You'll change your mind and come out of here and eat these Brussels sprouts. Right? That's what Carrie says. You're going to come eat these eventually, Brad Coates. You just come. <laughs> We, he talks about when Moses went up into the mountain to hear from God, to receive the commandments, to give them very clear direction on how to, how to bring things back in order, even though they're in that chaos of the desert. Moses is up in the mountain. He's receiving from God. They can hear the thunder, the lightning. They know supernatural things are happening on that mountaintop. They, they, uh, they know in their mind that God is meeting with Moses. They know that. It's just that there's in their spirit... Or in their spirit, they know they're meeting with God, but in their mind, they're doubting. And what do they do? They began to fashion a, a God of their own, just in case things didn't turn out well when Moses came down the mountain. And all through their lives, they found themselves this close to the promise, suddenly not being able to cross over. And each time they didn't cross over, what happened? They would go into a season of anxiety. They'd go into a season of, st- of stress. They would begin to moan and complain. Man, is this, this manna, manna for breakfast, manna for lunch, manna for dinner. Man, can we just have some meat? I'd just like some meat with my manna. I'd like to make a sandwich. This is crazy. Always fussing, always not happy, always, never at rest. Always in turmoil. Now we move into Hebrews chapter 4. Follow along in your Bibles if you have them. Uh, Hebrews 4, verse number 1. <clears throat> Therefore, since the promise of entering his rest still stands, okay, since the promise to enter over into his promise, it's still there, it hasn't gone away, let us be careful that none of you be found to have fallen short of it. You don't want to get to the 99-yard line and then give up. The promised land is right across that next bridge. For we also have had the good news proclaimed to us, just as they did. But the message that they heard was of no value to them because they did not share the faith. In other words, they did not combine it with faith in the knowledge of who Jesus is. They didn't have the fullness as the, as the people that the writer of Hebrews was speaking to. The Israelites had promise of a Messiah one day. They had a promise that a deliverer was going to carry them, but it wasn't a, the fullness of it wasn't complete for them in their minds yet. They did not combine it with faith. Now we who have believed enter that rest. Everybody say rest. Say enter that rest. Those who believe enter that rest now. That now's their time. Just as God had said. In the New, New Living Translation, it says, For only we who believe can enter his rest. God wants you to enter into rest. But the kind of rest that I'm talking about is a spiritual thing. It's not a physical thing. It's not man 
today when I get, all, get done after busy all weekend and we cooked, I don't know, how many burgers did we end up cooking, Jeremy? Probably 150 burgers yesterday, if not more. 150, 160 burgers we cooked for the men's conference. Whew, and a, a ton of, I don't know how many hot dogs, over 100 hot dogs. And uh, then, then having all the sessions and stuff, man, let me tell you something. This afternoon, God has ordained for me to nap. I mean, it's there. I will be entering into my rest. But this isn't that kind of rest. That rest is good rest, isn't it? But that rest lasts for a moment. The rest I'm talking about is a rest that, 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 la that can last for eternity. It can last for a lifetime. It's the kind of rest that sustains you. It doesn't make you just feel a little bit better so you can get back at it and not quite as tired as you were before. No, this is the kind of rest that sustains the brokenhearted, that delivers the one who is in doubt and in fear. It's the one that takes you from the world of anxiety and doubts and fears and causes you to live in God's world of peace that passes all understanding. Anyone can feel like they just need rest, a little vacation, a little time away, right? But what happens every time you take a little vacation? What happened after you took your vacation to Florida, Pastor Patrick? Yeah, you had to come back, number one, so that kind of stinks. And then when you got back, you needed a vacation from your vacation, right? I just needed to get a little energy so I can go back to work because I wore myself out, right? We, we, we work so hard at trying to rest, but see, the rest I'm talking about, you don't work hard at it all. It's the fruit of something that is born out of someone who recognizes what God has in store for them. I'm going to talk to you a couple things very quickly. God has promised rest to those who want it. It is a promise of God. It is yours for the taking. It is not just being offered up if you meet certain criteria. It, it's only offered up to people who have been Christians for six years or if you've read through the New Testament this year. There's no stipulations, no restrictions. Oh, well, I've been, I've been good this week. Oh, I messed up twice this week, so I've got to wait till next week before I can have my rest. Let me tell you something. There are no restrictions to this. The rest that God wants to offer is available to anyone who is willing to receive it. I'm here to tell you something. I believe God can offer rest to somebody who genuinely still hasn't made the full commitment to Him as their Lord and Savior yet. Now let that soak in. Let that float your boat or sink it. <laughs> I believe that God will give rest to somebody who's still trying to figure out the whole God thing. And you know why I believe that? Because I believe in a God, I believe in Jesus, who would walk up to people on the streets, who would say, have, have mercy on me. And he didn't look at them and say, well, uh, do, you have a, do you have a business card? Which church do you belong to? Are you credentialed? What have you done for the Lord lately? Show me your Bible. I want to see where you've been marking up your, marking up your uh, Pentateuch there, where you've been you know, highlighting the pages you like. I would need you to show me that you're worthy of, of, of something from me. I need to know that you've risen to a point where now I can give you this gift. He, he didn't do that, did he? Now, sometimes he would challenge them. He'd make them grow. But he still gave them the gift, even, no matter what. If he felt moved to touch them, he would move them. And I'm here to tell you something. If somebody's hungry for rest in God, he's willing to give it to them even if it means they're not quite there yet. Sad part is that he'll do that for people that don't even completely believe. And yet those of us who believe put off taking hold of it into our lives. I mean, if he can offer it to somebody who's, who's on the fence, well, how excited is he to offer it to you? To give you rest, Chad. How excited is he to offer it to you? To you. How, how much joy does it bring to Him to give it to you? God has promised rest. He's promised it to those who believe. Do you believe that God can give you genuine rest? He can give you a, a calm without explaining the process. But God, how can I ever be calm? Do you, don't you know where I am? Don't you know what I'm going through? How is this going to work out? Because show me how it's going to work out, and then I'll be calm. And God's going, that's not how this works. I'm going to give you calm so that you can 
be sustained in the storm. I'm going to bring you to the eye of the storm. Well, it's going to still be raging all around you, but I'm going to bring you to the center where the winds die down and it's calm. It's eerily, eerily calm in the center of that storm. And it's there where you and I will meet. It's promised in the Old Testament, even without a Messiah, but, but when they didn't find it, they didn't get their reward. When they didn't find that calm, when they didn't, when they didn't give in, when, when God said, okay, let's go across, and two spies said, well, it's good, let's go, and the rest said no. When they didn't accept it that was there, then it didn't happen. Why? And I want you to catch this. This is the key point. Why do we not get the rest we desperately need when we need it? Simple. We don't trust God's word. We don't trust God's word. Well, I know you said this and this and this, but you know, let me explain to you my let me let me explain to you my situation. We don't trust God's word. Rest comes from faith in God's word. Rest comes from faith in God's word. Because when you put genuine faith in God's word and you trust it even when it doesn't make sense and when you trust it and you, you're, that, you're that one that goes to the doctor and the doctor says, try this, and you're going, that'll never work. That's a waste of time. That's just stupid. And then suddenly you do it and all of a sudden you find that it worked. Sometimes. Let me tell you something. With your heavenly father, with a great physician, when you come to him and he says, do this and live, it's going to work. It's going to work every time. He's a great physician. He's not practicing medicine. He knows exactly what he's doing. And when he speaks it over your life, if you'll follow that word, you'll follow that guide of his word, then peace and rest comes through the obedience of God's word. The governor of the Plymouth colonies of of the pilgrims back in the day, he made this statement. He said, those who believe in the Holy Scriptures are bound to observe its teaching. All right? Those who do not are to be bound by its consequences. That's a, that's a truth that every one of us needs to recognize and embrace because that is the story of our lives today. If you believe in the Holy Scriptures and you bind yourselves to observe those teachings and to obey those laws, you're going to discover freedom, liberty, and real rest. Rest in the midst of the trials and adversities. The kind of rest that laying down on your bed and taking a nap will never get for you. I'm talking spiritual rest. But for those who do not obey, who do not observe the law, who continue to say, well, that's good, but that's not for me right now, and, and I, I, I'm working on it. I'm a work in progress. Well, all you're saying is, I'm embracing it still and I'm not ready to let go of it. Then you're going to be bound by the consequences of that law. And when you're bound by consequences of law, what do you possess in your life? Rest? Peace? No. Nah. Anxiety? Fear? Anger? Bitterness? All the other fruits? that you want to rid your life of. Listen, God's rest is available, but only through faith and obedience in His Word. All, Isaiah 30 says, Although the Lord gives you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction, your teachers will be hidden no more. With your own eyes you will see them. Whether you turn to the right or to the left, your ears will hear a voice behind you saying, This is the way. Walk in it. This is it. I love the way it says that, though. The Lord gives you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction. Let that soak in for a minute. Bread is my, uh, is my sustenance. Adversity is part of the sustenance in my Christian growth. Water is what sustains me. Affliction is what God uses in my life to sustain me in my faith walk. Oh, I could be so much stronger for the Lord if it, everything would just go right. No, you, no, you wouldn't. No, you couldn't. 
You couldn't, you couldn't be stronger because strength is born out of these things. You're fed. Your spirit is fed through these things. But the difference is we don't, we don't let these things define who we are and who God is. We recognize them as tools in God's hands. And if we remain obedient to God's word, he will either remove it from our lives, if it's a plan of the enemy, to destroy us, or he will use it if it is his plan to make us something stronger and greater for himself and for ourselves. And when we become stronger and we grow greater, we discover rest. We become that strange and peculiar people that people talk about those Christians. Simple, right? But it is hard. Restful life is laborious. That's my timer. That means I've got to wrap this up. I did it because I knew I'm going to have to shorten it because we spent so much time on other stuff. So I'm going to wrap it up. But I'm almost there. It's good. It sounds simple. We get excited. We clap. And it makes sense, right? Does it not, does it not make sense? If we could just live this way, it will be a better life. I know I'm not doing it. And I know I should have known before. But it's good to be reminded because maybe this time we'll get it. You ever had to teach your kids and you have to teach them the 14th time on how you want them to do the dishes or do something? And it's like, don't you get tired of telling them? Well, yeah, I do, but I keep telling them because one day it's going to stick. And then I'll actually start doing it the way I want it. And then it'll turn out good and everybody will be happy. It's the way it is with you and your, your life with God. This is a good thing. It's simple, but here it is the thing. Restful life is laborious. A restful life does have labor in it. Verse number 11 in Hebrews 4 goes on and says, Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will perish by following their example of disobedience. The King James, it says it's simpler. Let us labor therefore to enter into that rest. Yeah. We want rest, but we don't want it to be hard work. We want to get to that place where we can genuinely just go, I'm telling you, I'm at a place right now, nothing can touch me. I'm good. Somebody comes up and says, how you doing? And you can look at them and, and think about it for a second and look, at them, look in their eyes and say, I'm good. No, seriously, I'm good. I'm at a place in my life. There's a, there's a rest in me. There's a calm in me. But aren't you still this? Aren't you still that? What, what happened to that? Is this still a, Oh, yeah, that's still out there, you know. And if it's the devil's tool, God's going to snatch it away. And if it's God's tool, I'm going to pay attention. I'm going to learn from it. I'm going to grow from it. It's going to feed me. It's going to satisfy me. And I'm going to be better for it. But, but right now where I am, I'm just saying it. I'm at rest. I'm good. I'm good. Thanks for asking. How are you? <laughs> you want some rest in your life? I'm going to close with this illustration. And uh, you don't have to worry about it, Susie. We're not going to, at this point, we're not going to worry about it. We're good. Thanks. It is not difficult in our world to get a person interested in the message of the gospel. It is terrifyingly difficult to sustain that interest. See if this doesn't sound, ring true in your lives. Millions of people in our culture make decisions for Christ, but there is a dreadful attrition rate. Many claim to have been born again, but the evidence for mature Christian discipleship is slim. In our kind of culture, anything, even news about God, can be sold if it is packaged freshly. But when it loses its novelty, it goes on the garbage heap. There is a great market for religious experience in our world. I've shared with you that before. About the, the, the actually today in America's culture, uh, uh, in opposition to what people think, there's the largest spiritual uh, um, awakening mindset in America today than it's ever been in its history. It's just that they're turning to all the wrong things for their spiritual awakening. But they're, 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 they're spiritual. They want a f spiritual answer. They're just not interested in our answer. There's a great market for religious experience in our world. There is little enthusiasm, though, for the patient acquisition of virtue. Virtue is born out of what? 
strife, challenge, adversity. Little inclination to sign up for a long apprenticeship in what earlier generations of Christians called holiness. The Christian life is about so much more than just an altar call experience, my friends. Too many people are willing to embrace Jesus so they can get into heaven, but they don't want to hear what the Bible teaches about their sinful lifestyle that requires changes today in their lives. It's tough love time. I love each and every one of you. I'm going to hold on to this just so I don't get, get off track. But everything that I was wanting to do this morning, I knew I just had, I needed to get to this point. Because this is what God has mandated for me to speak over you. It's tough love time. I, I, wa I want to believe that, that our church today is not a part of the normal model of the church in America today. I'm very proud of, of how far this church, you guys have come. How far, and the heritage, 90 years of heritage that we have in this church, the things that have been accomplished through you and with you. And we continue to do that. We continue to find new ways to reach out. We continue to draw people in and to nurture them and to help them. We continue to do what God's called us to do. And so I want to believe that we're not, we're not part of the statistic. But just because I want, don't want us to be a part of the statistic, it doesn't mean that the reality of the, of the church in America is that we're not a part of that reality. We are a part of that reality. What is that reality? Well, you may be here today and you love God. And you believe in Him. But there's just something that you're holding on to. You see, there is a great possibility that sitting in this room today, there are actually more of you that are living in some form of sin than you that aren't. Don't get mad. Just hold on. Because if we ever want to be truly free, if we ever want to really rest, we've got to be honest and recognize who we are and where we're at. We have to understand that, that to find the real rest in God, the kind that sustains us through whatever comes our way, it is born out of obedience to God's Word. There isn't another way. There isn't a shortcut. There's not a Kool-Aid I can make. There's nothing else. There's no protein bar, no faith bar. We have to live out God's Word, and we have to apply it. And sometimes when we apply it, it's like exercising. It's like getting on that diet you got to get on so you don't die tomorrow. You, know? you hate it, but you've got to do it. If you want to survive, you have got to do the tough things. It is laborious. But it is worth it. Because God wants you to live with a rest in your life that will literally blow you away. The question you have to answer between you and Him, not me, you and Him. What in your life are you holding on to that is in opposition to His Word? What is it in your life that you're being a good Christian, you're coming to church, you're serving, you're teaching, you're involved in programs, and you're doing mighty things. And yet, in the midst of that, you realize, man, it's really good, and I love it, and, and it feels like when I go to celebrate recovery, and I, and I teach a study group, it's like I feel like I took a really long nap. I'm really energetic, and I'm excited, but that wears off, and, then, and pretty soon, I'm, I'm back in the stress of my life, and I don't understand why. Maybe because as a leader, you're still holding on to something. That God said, you need to surrender that. I don't want you to keep looping around the desert of your life. I don't want you to keep taking laps. I want you to come back to the edge of the water. I want you to lay aside the thing that easily besets you. And I want you to step on in and come across to your rest. To your rest. Let us rest. Let us be honest with God. And say, today's the day that I finally trust you to help me with something I've known for a long time I needed to be rid of. And I've made lots of excuses. 
I've made it comfortable in my life. I've accepted it, and I've made it a, a friend. I've given. I've made it a room in my in the temple of my heart where it can live back in the back in the dark. So hopefully nobody notices it. Brothers and sisters, nobody's calling you an evil sinner. What I'm saying is, you're a believer who's lacking the rest that God wants to reward you with. And the way to get that rest is to make some decisions in your life. Father, over this congregation today, every walk of life, every level of faith and path, we've got people that are brand new to church, we've got others that they, they're pretty sure they were born in a pew. And it doesn't matter how long we've served you. It doesn't matter what, what faith background we came from or we're in now. It doesn't matter how deep our knowledge is or how shallow our knowledge is. Because today, the only truth that we need to be aware of is so simple and, and, so, and it's a bite-sized uh, piece that everyone in this room can, can take and consume. And, it can, and if we will do that, it can revolutionize our faith walk, no matter what level our faith walk is at. It can take us to another level, like nothing else can. It's time for God's church to find rest within our souls. We live in a tumultuous, crazy world, confusing and hard and difficult. But we can live at peace. First things first. Speak into every person right now. I want each and every one of you to open up your heart, open up your spirit, and say, Come, Lord Jesus, show me the way. Say that with me. Come, Lord Jesus, show me the way. Say it again. Come, Lord Jesus, show me the way. Show me the way that I need to move, the direction I need to go. God, I, I know it's there, and I know you know it's there, and I know I've made excuses, and I know I've put it off, and I know I've been waiting for the right time. But God, I'm weary, and I'm tired of struggling in my faith. I'm tired of being up and down and in and out. And I know today, because your word spoke it to me, Hebrews spoke it to me, I, 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 it's a simple process. I need to take inventory and take those things that are in my life that do not belong, and I know they do not belong, and I need to, with God's help, say, today's the day you're gone. Today's the day I break the cycle. Today's the day I cast you out. Today's the day I set, I am set free through the power of the Holy Spirit to never again be in bondage to alcohol, to be in bondage to cigarettes, to be in bondage to anger, to be in bondage to fear. I will no longer be in bondage to doubt. I will not be Thomas. And every time something good happens, I'm finding a reason why it's not going to work out. I don't want to live like that. That is the enemy's work. And God, it's going to be hard, and so I need your help to be genuinely free of that thing. But I know when I can be free and my temple is clear, then there will come a spirit of rest for the weary like none I've ever known. And I hunger for that rest right now in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. If you receive that, say, me too, Lord. Amen. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. Now, just like any good sermon. Did you like it? Was it a good sermon? Okay. Now comes the part that matters. You have to apply it. You have to do something with it. If you go up to a mirror and you look in the mirror and you look at it and you go, looking good. And then you walk away. You'll never lose that extra 25 pounds. Yeah, you're looking good for where you are. But if you really want to look like you want to be, you've got to walk away from that mirror and be inspired to do the work. Leave here today inspired to do the work. God has a rest for you. But the, but the path is clear. Amen. God bless you. Have a blessed week.